Well, again, I want to thank all of you for joining us again this week. And again, for those who are joining us for the first time, you are welcome here. And we are so glad to be able to share in this time together. Every Thursday, we take this time to study together in some particular area. And right now, we're going through a general study of basic Bible theology. And it, I, I love having the opportunity to share with you, there are many of our pastors who have had formal Bible college training, and, and I'm so glad that you've had that opportunity. But there are many of the pastors who are on our Bible study platform, whether it's Pastor Steve's Bible study or the Tanzania line that's joined us. Uh, there are many pastors who have not had the opportunity to formally study the Bible and theology. And so, Right now, especially for those people who have not had a chance to have formal education and training in theology, or for those of us who just need to be reminded of the key doctrines of Scripture, that all fundamental, evangelical, orthodox, regardless of which word you use, Every Bible-believing pastor needs to be reminded at times of the great theological, biblical truths that represent our faith, and that's what we're going through right now, a, a course in the basic doctrines of the Bible. And the first great area of theology that we're looking at is the doctrine of the Bible itself. Now, each week, I share with you my screen so that you can see where we're going with our study, and so let me do that for you right now, and it takes just a minute for me to set all of this up when we're going through this, so if you'll give me just a moment, and oops, hold on, I almost canceled our meeting. Uh, here we go, and there we go. Now, here are the areas of theology that we are looking at as we go through this study together. First, we are studying the doctrine of the Bible, which in theological terms is called bibliology. Then when we finish this, next week we'll come back and we'll look at the doctrine of God. And when we talk about the Trinity, we're talking about the Godhead, and that's the term that's used to describe God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in their triune form. But when we're talking about just the study of God the Father, that's called theology proper. And then we'll study the, the doctrines, the biblical doctrines of Jesus, dealing with his life, his nature, his death and suffering, his resurrection, and all of that comes under the theological heading called Christology. Then we'll come back and look at Lesson 5, which is the doctrine of people, anthropology, and sin, hamartiology. And then we're going to look at the doctrine of salvation, which is soteriology. We'll look at the doctrines of the angels, Satan, and demons. And angels is angelology, and Satan and demons falls under the category called demonology. Then we're going to come and look at the doctrines of the church. And that's, in theological terms, that's ecclesiology. And then finally, the last big lesson that we're going to look at, and this will take us probably two or three weeks to look at the doctrine of future events or the things to come, and that's called eschatology. So all of these are the great areas of theology that every pastor should be familiar with. Now, it would be wonderful if every Christian would study them and have a general understanding of them, but it is critical for pastors, if we are going to be able to accurately teach the Word of God to people in our churches, we must be familiar with these things. 
Because if we don't understand the basic theology of the Bible, then how will our people learn them, and how will we be able to protect them from false teachings? And so that's why we're going through this study together. Now, as we're looking at the doctrine of the Bible, or bibliology, we're taking three weeks to do that. We've already gone through the first two lessons, and today is the third lesson in bibliology. And as we're jumping into this, I want to review just for a moment. And a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you that as you study through the scriptures, you understand that God has provided revelation of himself, the knowledge of God that exists. And God has revealed himself to us and provided revelation in three primary ways. The first is creation, and we read in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God, and God in every form of natural creation has revealed his divine presence and power. In fact, in Romans, Paul writes and says that through natural revelation, through everything that exists, God has revealed his existence and divine attributes in such a powerful way that there isn't a single person who has ever lived who is without excuse and says, I don't, I can't see that there is a God that exists. The Bible is absolutely clear that we know that God is a, an all-powerful, creative, and divinely controlling God. He has all power, and he has done all these things, and he reveals that to us in creation. But the limitation of natural creation is that while we know that God exists, we cannot have a personal relationship with God simply through natural revelation. In order to have a, re a relationship with God, that takes something more. And there are two forms of what's called special revelation that God has given us. And the first is the Bible, and the second is Jesus. Now, the Bible is the written Word of God, and Jesus is the living Word of God. The Bible tells us how to have a relationship with God the Father, but only through Jesus is that relationship possible. The Bible is what God's gift to mankind is so that we understand who God is, the nature of our lives, our need for him, and how we can come to faith through Jesus. And through Jesus, in his suffering and death, when he paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, he made it possible through his suffering, death, and resurrection for us to be brought into relationship when we place our trust in Jesus. Only Jesus can save us from our sins, and only Jesus can bring us into relationship with him. In Acts chapter 4, it is absolutely clear. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the light. I am the good shepherd. I am. And Jesus gave us in John chapter 10, this clear understanding that as the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, only through Jesus can we come to faith in Christ. And then as we come to faith in Christ, we are brought into relationship. We're forgiven of our sins. We're restored. And we are now in the family of God. Jesus made this clear in John chapter 3 as he was talking to Nicodemus, that it's only through his suffering and death. Jesus was God's son who came. It was God in human flesh who came to make a relationship possible. Now, having understood this, we look and say, all right, if the Bible is the only only form of revelation that's been given to us that gives us a clear understanding of how we can be brought into relationship with God. 
if the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments is centered around the redemptive promises of God for man, this makes it so important for us as pastors to be able to understand the Bible properly and to teach it properly. And this is the burden of responsibility that God has given us as teachers of the Bible. Remember, whether we're talking about the Old Testament or the New Testament, in all 66 books of the Bible, there is one great historical and spiritual theme, and that is God's redemptive love for those he's created. That's why God gave us the Bible in both the Old and the New Testaments. And the entire Bible is centered around this one theme, God's redemptive love. God's redemptive love. It's promised in the earliest books of the Bible when you go back to Genesis. It starts in Genesis 3.15 as you have the first promise of redemption. It's pictured in the Mosaic Law as God presents his moral expectations for mankind to reveal that we are sinners. It's pictured in the Mosaic Law through all of the sacrifices and the sin offerings that God said, you need to make a sacrifice. The innocent needs to die for the guilty. And then it's fully explained in the New Testament when we find the Gospels and Jesus saying, I'm the one who's come. I am not only Israel's king, but I am the Savior of the world. I'm the Redeemer that was promised. It's written about in all of the letters of Paul and Peter and John as we read through the New Testament. Everything in the Bible ultimately points us to Jesus, to Jesus. Now, if the Bible is the only written form of communication and God being relational wants to communicate with us, and it is absolutely critical that we understand that God gave us the Bible so that we have one clear communication. God does not primarily speak in dreams and visions anymore because the Bible is complete. We have one objective standard that God has given us. In the Old Testament, you find many times before the written word that God would speak to people in dreams and visions, and the Holy Spirit would speak through the prophets. But now that we have the Bible, we have one clear objective form of communication. And all of the Bible points us to Jesus. Now, having understood that, last week we talked all about the nature of biblical uh, inspiration, it, the fact that the Bible was given to us by God. And again, I want to just do some quick review here. In 2 Timothy 3.16, we read that all Scripture is inspired by God. And I shared with you last week that that word inspired literally means it's God-breathed. And then we saw last week the Bible's value in our life. God breathed the message, every literal word, into the minds of the prophets, not just the thoughts or ideas, but the Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets and gave them every single word. And God says, this is the importance of the Bible in your life. All Scripture is given by God or God-breathed and is useful for four things. To teach us what is true, to make us realize what's wrong in our lives, to correct us when our thinking is wrong, and to teach us to do what is right. The Bible was given to us to teach us theology in terms of the nature of God and the message of God. The Bible was given to us in order to help us understand why we need God and the fact that we are sinners and have to have correction in our lives. And so when we come into relationship with God through Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts using the Word to shape us and to change us like a mirror. When we look into a mirror and say, oh, I need to comb my hair. Oh, I need to take care of this. That's exactly what the Bible does for us. It corrects us when we're wrong and tells us what to do that will honor God. It teaches us to do right. Now, having understood the value of the Bible, 
Now we want to properly understand the Bible and how God uses the Bible to teach us. Last week, we spent our time going through an area of theological interest, biblical and theological interest called numerology. And we looked at the issue of the question of, do numbers in the Bible have special meaning? And we saw, yes, there are several numbers that we find in the scriptures that are used over and over in very specific patterns. And in each of those patterns, you see a sense of purpose or meaning to those numbers. But now, and if you didn't get a chance to see that, you can go online and I can even post that link again for you today. But today we're coming to what I believe is the most important lesson that any of us as pastors will ever have to address in our lives. And that is the issue of basic biblical interpretation. How do we, especially as pastors and Bible teachers, how do we properly understand the Bible, interpret the Bible, and then so that we can properly teach the Bible? Now, my friends, let me make this absolutely clear. You and I as pastors and Bible teachers will never be able to properly teach the Bible if we don't have a system of understanding how to properly interpret the Bible. God calls us as pastors and Bible teachers to the difficult and challenging work of studying the Bible and making sure that we have a proper understanding or interpretation of Scripture so that we can accurately communicate the message of Scriptures to the people in our churches and the people in our lives. So that's where we're going today. Romans 15.4 is very interesting, where we read Paul saying, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us Today, the Bible isn't just an old book of 3,000 years or 2,000 years for the New Testament. It has no relevance for our world or our lives today. Everything that was written, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, wasn't just written for the people of their day, of their time, of their culture. But everything that God recorded through the prophets and the writers of Scripture was written for our value today. And it doesn't matter whether you live in America, India, Tanz uh, Tanzania, you name it. It doesn't matter what country or time period. The Bible was written and preserved for our value today. And the Scripture was given the scriptures give us patience and encouragement so that we can have hope. And friends, that's the message that God has called you and me to share with our churches and the world around us. The message of hope, the message of salvation, the message of patience that this life is not over the end when we die. There is still another world yet to come, another life that is eternal. And so this verse is the core verse of everything that you and I are going to study today. The fact that the Bible was written not just for their value, but for our value. Now, there's a theologian who has written this named Abraham Corvia. And I, I really like this statement. I want you to read it with me. And Corvia wrote and said, the work of the Bible teacher is not easy. Each week, this brave soul has to negotiate the challenging passage from the ancient text to a modern audience with authority and relevance. Did you understand what he just said there? The work that you and I do as Bible teachers is not easy. It's challenging. And it takes a brave soul to say, I am going to study the Bible. I'm going to make sure I understand it properly so that I can communicate and teach it properly to others. And every week, 
every week when I teach the Bible, whether it's here in this class or whether it's in my church, I have the responsibility from God. He has called me to this obligation to study, to study, to study, to be able to take the Word of God and study it in a way that says, I am a workman that does not need to be ashamed that I can stand in front of my congregation and listen, it doesn't matter whether your church has 10 people, 100, or 1,000. The responsibility that God gives us to teach the Bible is just important, just as important for 10 people as it is 1,000. Now, the first church that I pastored only had 35 people in it. And I pastored that church for many years while it was still a small church, and, and God blessed it, and it continued to grow. Finally, after when I left, after 20 years, it had grown to 450 people. And that was a, that was a wonderful blessing to see God bringing people into the church. But I want to make this I want to make this crystal clear. My responsibility as a Bible teacher was just as obligating to me when my church was 35 as it was when it grew to 450. The size of the church means nothing. It is the responsibility of the pastor and the Bible teacher to teach God's Word with accuracy and truth no matter how many people he brings into, how many sheep he brings into our fold. And so every single week, you and I have the, have the responsibility and must, with bravery and leading from the Holy Spirit, understand how to negotiate every passage of the Bible that goes from being an ancient text to something that we teach to our churches, to our culture, in our world, in our time, with authority and relevance says, this is how we understand the Word of God, and this is how it applies to our lives and our culture. The goal of this work, the work that you and I do to study and then teach, the goal of this work is to create a bridge spanning those waters through his knowledge of accurate biblical interpretation and theology. What he's saying in that last sentence is that here you have on one side, if you had like a river and you have on one side the land that is the historic text of the Bible, and here on the other side of the river is this modern culture that is 2,000 years after the New Testament was written, more than 3,000 years after the Old Testament was written. And somehow there has to be a bridge between the two. You and I are those bridges. You and I are the ones who, through our Bible study and teaching, take those Old Testament and New Testament passages that are thousands of years old, and we cross over to help our people understand how these great truths apply to their lives today. This is an awesome responsibility that God has given us. It is an incredible opportunity. And this is why God says, listen, when I call you to the ministry, this is the first and most important thing that you'll do. Now, the same man, Abraham Kuravia, writes about our role as preachers and teachers. Preaching is not only the interpretation of an authoritative biblical text, but also the relevant communication of a God-given message to real people living real lives with a real need for that message. It doesn't matter whether you're in India, Pakistan, Uganda, Tanzania, Wherever you might be, this sentence applies to you and to me here in America. Preaching is more than just having an understanding of the Bible, but it also involves the relevant communication, the relevant teaching, 
of God's message to real people who live real lives with a real need. Every single time you and I get in front of the pulpit, every single time you and I teach a Bible class. And it's my hope that you are able to do this with understanding and accuracy. Now, when we talk about Bible interpretation, the big term is hermeneutics, biblical hermeneutics. If you're not used to this term, I'm going to be pushing you and teaching some things that you may have never heard today before today, but this is so absolutely critical for us to understand where we're going as Bible teachers and how we are to do this. So the term hermeneutics is a very important term, whether we understand it or not. Every one of us, every one of us have a system of hermeneutics. Every single time we teach the Bible, it's based in something called hermeneutics. Now, there are two terms that are critical for us to understand when we're talking about the concept of biblical hermeneutics. The first term is hermeneutics itself, but the second term is exegesis. And you might say, well, what are these terms, and what do they represent? What's the difference between them? So let me show you. When we talk about the term hermeneutics, that is the term that refers to the very foundational system of Bible interpretation that guides one's entire approach to the interpretation and teaching of Scripture. This is absolutely critical for us to understand. Hermeneutics is the entire foundational system that I use, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. Every one of us have a biblical, we have a hermeneutic that determines how we read, study, and understand the Bible. Everyone does. The question isn't, do you have a hermeneutical system? It's, do you have the right hermeneutical system? And so, hermeneutics is the term that we use to represent the foundational system that everyone uses in one way or another to interpret the Bible, and it guides our entire approach to interpreting and then teaching. And the term exegesis then follows hermeneutics because exegesis is how I take a very specific passage, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It is the study and the interpretation of a specific passage of Scripture. Uh, so, understand this. Let's say that I want to build a house, and I have a system of engineering that I understand is necessary. These are the rules. Now, you may have if you live in a country or an area of the country that is affected by hurricanes, you will have a system of, of engineering and design that is based on what's needed for living in, in, here in our country, in Florida and or the southern states, where they are commonly hit by hurricanes and tornadoes. Now, in the north where we live, we don't have so many problems with that. And it's not that important. You can have two different styles of building houses. And the whole idea of, of design. But how you build the house is going to be directly dependent upon your system or understanding of what a house needs. And then you start building the house. And so Hermeneutics is like having a plan for how you build houses, and then exegesis is the actual building of the house. That's what we have in the scripture. Hermeneutics represents the entire system by which I understand and interpret the Bible. And then how I do that every single time I go to the scripture and teach part of the Bible, that's exegesis. So one is the plan for building it, the other is the actual building. Hermeneutics is how I interpret the Bible 
And then exegesis is the actual presentation of scripture as I'm preparing for a sermon or a lesson. Again, whether we realize it or not, whether it's conscious or unconscious, everyone has a hermeneutical system, a foundational system by which we take and read and interpret the Bible. And then we put that into practice. Our hermeneutic is put into practice through our exegesis or the actual study that we're doing. All right. Now, if you have these two words in mind, now what we're going to do is dig in and understand that there are three basic forms of hermeneutics. And these are the most common. I will talk about a fourth one, but it's not here. These are the three most basic forms of biblical hermeneutics, or the study of the Bible, the study and interpretation of the Bible. There is moral interpretation, there's allegorical interpretation, and there's literal interpretation. When we talk about having a moral hermeneutic system, a moral interpretation, and that is the entire foundation of how I study and interpret and teach the Bible. The moral interpretation is a system of interpreting Scripture to find the personal, moral, or ethical behavior intended in any passage. It's just basically saying that regardless of whether I'm studying in the Old Testament or the New Testament, how do I study this? to be a good person? How do I study this just to be a good person, to be moral or ethical? See, there are lots and lots and lots. I mean, America is filled with churches who don't, who don't believe in Jesus as the Son of God. One of the most famous presidents of the United States who wrote the American Constitution was a man named Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson did not believe in miracles. He did not believe that Jesus was God in human flesh. He only studied the Bible based on a moral interpretation, and he literally cut out all the things that were miraculous in the Bible. And there is a very famous Jefferson Bible that you can still see today where he edited out all of the miraculous elements and supernatural elements of the scripture. He was very clear. He thought Jesus was a great moral teacher, and he saw the Bible as simply a way to make us better people, not to bring us into relationship with God. And today there are churches all around America in every city, that are just like Thomas Jefferson. They read the Bible just to know how to be nicer, better, more ethical people. And the question that's regularly asked in this moral interpretation of Scripture is, what does this passage mean to me? Not They're not asking, what was the original intent of the author? What was the author intending or meaning to write? But just as I read this, what does this mean to me? And this is a very dangerous form of hermeneutics because it completely misses the redemptive element of Scripture. The second major form of hermeneutics or interpretation of the Bible is called the allegorical interpretation. And in the allegorical interpretation or hermen form of hermeneutics, the allegorical teaches that it is a system of interpreting Scripture that is always looking for secondary meanings to a passage of Scripture. And so, for example, the Old Testament People, places, and events are simply representative of what they would call a greater spiritual reality. For example, if they were studying in the Old Testament, they would say that all the lessons about David are really about Jesus, ultimately about Jesus. Now, there are times that David is used as a picture or a symbol 
or allegory of Jesus, but you can't say that David's entire life simply points us to Jesus. They would say that in the Old Testament, the priesthood was intended to be a spiritual picture of the church. They would say in prophecy that when you look at Revelation chapter 20, which speaks of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus in Jerusalem on the throne of David, that that is simply symbolic. It is figurative for the 2,000-year period of the church that we're in today, which is crazy. It's absolutely tragic because in this period that we're in today, if you study in Revelation 20, you'll see that Satan is chained in a pit, and he's not going to be free until the end of the thousand-year period. But look at the world today. If we are in the millennial period, if that 1,000 years is simply allegorical, if it's simply a symbolic picture of the church we're in today, something is wrong because Satan isn't in a pit today. And so, and I'll just share with you that all of covenant theology, all of covenant theology, which are churches that are either Catholic, Reformed, Presbyterian, Lutheran, all of the denominations that are based in what we call covenant theology are based in allegorical interpretation. Now, the Bible uses pictures and figurative language, but you can't say all of it is figurative. You can't say all of it is allegorical, or you miss the, the plain messages and promises that God has given us, and we can only understand in a literal interpretation of Scripture. Now, I see the hand raised here on the screen, so let me just finish this slide, and then I'll pause and take questions, all right? So the third primary form of biblical hermeneutics, or the system of interpretation, is called the literal interpretation, and it is also called the grammatical historical interpretation. And in my mind, as a Bible teacher and a student of the Word, this is the only correct interpretive hermeneutic of Scripture. This is the entire framework by which I understand, interpret, and teach the Bible. It's all based in the literal, grammatical, historical interpretation. And what this teaches is that the literal interpretation, the literal hermeneutic of Scripture is a system of interpreting Scripture that is based in finding, and this is so important, it is finding the simple, plain meaning that was intended in any given passage of Scripture. There is one primary message in every single passage of Scripture. What is that message? What is that teaching? And I want to understand it, not in some symbolic figurative language, but the way that God intended it. All right, so everything that we're going to look at from this point on is all based in the literal interpretation, the literal hermeneutic of Scripture, because I believe that this is the only correct full system by which we can properly understand and teach the Bible. Okay? So now, somebody's raised their hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and pause for a second. I know this is a lot that I'm going to be going through here today, but let me see if I can, who's got their hand raised? And I'm going to ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask your question that you have. Go ahead. Anybody? There we are. All right. I, does somebody have a question up to this point on the three systems of interpretation? <laughs> 
All right. Okay. Uh, I got the question here asking if I would send out the PDF. And yes, after our lesson is done, I will go ahead and I'll send this out so that everyone can see this and follow it. And I'm also going to post this lesson on our uh, on our WhatsApp platform. All right. So these are the three terms that I shared with you about this biblical form of hermeneutics, the literal, grammatical, and historical. So when we use these three terms, what do we mean? And by the term literal, we mean that we take words for what they mean in their normal, plain sense. God communicates with language. Language, not, a, not just general thoughts, with specific words. And words mean something. And it doesn't matter if we're going from one language to another. Still, we can understand words for what they mean. So it, when we use the concept of being literal in our interpretation, we're just saying, all right, what's the normal use for this word? When we talk about our hermeneutic being grammatical, that means that when we are studying and understanding, we follow the basic grammatical rules of literature. God communicates to us both verbally and in the form of literature with normal words. We take them for their normal plain sense, and we are also studying this because it was written in writing. We want to understand it grammatically in the sense of how do you understand anything that's written? What's the normal way of reading and studying and understanding things that are in written form? And then finally, the word historical. We carefully study the historical background and the context of the passage before deciding what it means. Now, this sounds crazy, but there are many people who read the Bible, who have already decided what they think it means, and instead of studying it to find out what it means to decide what my interpretation is, we take our interpretation or our ideas and we impose that on the Bible, and we try to make the Bible fit our way of thinking. And that's terrible. That's, that's not the way you do it. We have the responsibility of studying the historical background. When was this time? When was it written? Who was it written to? How did they understand it? Before we even start with ourselves or our culture. So these three words are like the foundational words underneath this whole hermeneutical system of understanding. Literal, we take words for what they mean in the normal plain sense. We follow the grammatical rules because God chose literature for us to understand these things. And then we study it in the background and the context of the writing before we decide how to apply it to our, our lives and our culture. All right, so now here we're going to dig in and we're going to dig in deep. Because if we're going to properly do this, there are some rules for literal hermeneutics. There are some rules for how we interpret things. And the first one is that you have to determine the type of literature. Now, I, if, you're, if you're able to take notes as I'm talking, that's great. If you can't, I'll be posting this so you can see it and follow along and you can listen to it or watch it again. But the first step in having a biblical, literal, hermeneutical system for understanding and interpreting is that we have to recognize what type of literature we're reading. And as you read through the Bible, it is very clear that there are all sorts of different types of literature. When Paul is writing all of his letters, like Romans and Ephesians and Colossians, those letters are written in what we call a didactic or teaching form. He's teaching theology. He's teaching us how we're supposed to understand and apply these things. And that's very different than when we're reading in Genesis or in the Gospels, which are written in biographical form. 
And those are very different than when we're reading through Joshua or Judges in the Old Testament that represents books of history. Now, biography and history are similar in that they're both narrative forms, but they're different types of narratives. Biography and history all represent stories of the past, but one is about a person and the other is about the events of that time period. And in biography, you have primarily the story of people who live and you have some explanation about how they lived. History is primarily how they lived with some stories about the people. They're both narratives, but even how I understand and interpret biography is going to be a little bit different than history. Prophecy is a different beast altogether because prophecy, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, is always being written in a predictive form. It's always being written about something that's still yet to happen. And would it surprise you to know when you have poetry and you're reading through the Psalms or Proverbs or other passages, would it surprise you to know that 25% of the Bible was written as poetry? And many of the great prophetic passages were also written in poetry form. So if you and I as Bible teachers are going to study through the Psalms that all point to Jesus, the great messianic songs, then we have to understand both prophecy and poetry together. And when you're studying Hebrew poetry, it is really unique because Hebrew poetry is written in what we call parallel form. There is always a statement and then a restatement. And people who do not understand how to interpret poetry often misrepresent the Psalms because they don't understand the concept of Hebrew parallelism. In Hebrew poetry, there's always a statement and a restatement. Sometimes the statement will be the restatement will say exactly the same thing in just different words. Sometimes you'll have enhanced parallelism or the restatement says something greater or more enhanced or completes the idea of the original statement. Then sometimes you have contrasting statements or restatements, and it says exactly the opposite of what the original statement was. But if you don't understand Hebrew poetry, you're going to be open to all sorts of different interpretations. So this is very, very important in studying the Bible, in understanding what kind of literature we're working with. And then once I understand, am I dealing with the didactic teaching? Is it biography? Is it history? Is it prophecy? Is it poetry? Then we go to the second rule for interpreting, and that is recognizing the context of the passage. The context of the passage. And what does that mean? We understand when and how very specific words and phrases are used within a story. We understand the terms that are used. We understand the culture that's being represented. And even more important, just as importantly, not more importantly, but just as importantly, and I want you to notice on the screen this term, we understand the biblical theology. All right, friends, if you're not used to theology, there are two different types of theology. One is called systematic theology, and the other is biblical theology. What we're doing every Thursday as we take the doctrine of the Bible, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of the future events, those topical subjects of theology are based in the concept of systematic theology. What we're doing is taking all these different passages from the Bible, and we're putting them together in organized patterns. Here we're talking about all the different verses that refer to the character and the nature of God. That's systematic theology. Here we're talking about all the verses about Jesus. Here we're talking about the verses of the Bible. Here's the doctrine of sin or salvation. or Those are systematic theology. When you take a form of theology and you topically teach that, that's systematic. 
But biblical theology is a technical term that's very different from systematic theology. Systematic theology says, what did God teach us about this subject? Biblical theology is the study of unfolding time patterns. And what we find in the scriptures is in biblical theology, there are different time patterns of truth. For example, in the Old Testament, we have the Mosaic Law. In the New Testament, we have the New Covenant. And the rules of understanding the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, are very different from the New Covenant. All right. I'm going to step into, hopefully, I'm not going to step into a pit, but I'm going to step into a challenging issue. Why is it that Seventh-day Adventists only worship on Saturdays and still observe the Old Testament dietary restrictions when the rest of us don't? And the answer is very simple. Because Seventh-day Adventists, like some other denominations, miss the importance of understanding biblical theology and the fact that there are time patterns. The Old Covenant is done. The New Covenant is here. But when you only pick and choose certain verses, you can come up with a theology that is sometimes a little bit skewed. And their intentions are good. But if you don't understand what biblical theology represents, the fact that there are definite time patterns in Scripture, then you're going to be in trouble. When you look at the early church in the first couple chapters of Acts, it is normative for there to be revelations through tongues and miraculous healings. But isn't it interesting, if you study what we call the biblical theology of the book of Acts, by the end of the book of Acts, those miraculous revelations that were confer confirmations of the gospel message do not happen as often as they did in the first book, uh, chapters of Acts. And there's a reason. Because, and as you study the biblical theology of Acts, you see that as the gospel was being introduced into new cultures, God was confirming the message through those signs and wonders. And by the time that we get to the end of the book of Acts, you see the miracle of changed lives. And there isn't a need for those supernatural signs that you had at the beginning of the church age. And I can point to this in every part of the Bible. You have to understand how biblical theology works to appreciate and understand the context of most passages. And then finally, under understanding the context of a passage, you have the fact that even within a literal interpretation of Scripture, we still use normal figures of speech. Do you understand the difference between having a literal interpretation and what we call a literalistic interpretation? In a literal interpretation, we still have figures of speech. In a literalistic interpretation, there are no figures of speech. Every word is supposed to be true. For example, in Revelation, where the angels stand at the four corners of the earth, is the earth round or square? A literal interpretation says, yes, there are still figures of speech, and the earth can be round, and yet God can use this picture of the four corners of the earth, and it's fine. But believe it or not, I grew up in a church that was based in a literalistic form of interpretation, and the pastor and this was long before I was born, but the pastor famously believed that the earth was square because the Bible says there are four corners of the earth. 
What do we do with the passage when God says poetically that the trees of the field will clap their hands? Has anyone ever seen a tree with hands before? What do we do with the characterizations or descriptions of God, where God says, I've gathered you like a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and God says, I'm going to carry you with my wings. Does that mean that God has literal wings like a bird? A literal interpretation says, of course not. There are figures of speech, but a literalistic interpretation says, yes. Every single word is exactly is exactly what it's supposed to say and, and what it looks like. And so somebody who doesn't understand the difference between literal versus literalistic is going to have a ter terrible time understanding and, and, and properly interpreting the Bible and teaching it. What I'm challenging you to do today is understand what a biblical hermeneutic, a biblical framework for understanding Scripture is so that you can properly teach it. So we recognize the type of literature that we're dealing with in the Bible. We understand the context, which includes specific words and phrases and the biblical theology, the time patterns, and the normal figures of speech. And then, number three, we look at the seven core questions for literal interpretation. Now, I'm going to share what those are, but there are seven, every single time you and I are studying the Bible, and I have to do this every single week when I'm studying the Bible to preach a sermon. There are seven questions that you and I as Bible teachers ought to be able to ask ourselves and make sure that we understand. And here are those seven questions. Look, number one, what did the author say? What was the author writing? What words did he use? What phrases did he use? And what did that mean? And then number two, what did the author mean when he wrote those things? Why were those words used? Why were these details provided? What was the primary message of this passage? These are the two first and most important questions. What did the author say? And what did the writer mean? And then number three, make sure, and we just talked about this, are there changing patterns of biblical theology? Is there a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? The expectations. If we're still living under the law, why aren't we making sacrifices? Why are we wearing clothing that has two different uh, types of fabric, which was forbidden in the Old Testament? Why do I eat pizza where you have meat and milk together, which is a violation of the Old Testament law? So I have to, in order to properly understand, I have to make sure I understand, is this is this particular thing that I'm studying something that God has given for us today in an application, or is there a principle that I can learn from the Old Testament, and it's different in the biblical theology, the biblical time period? Number four, what did other Bible writers or authors say on the same subject? If I'm going to talk about prophecy, I'm not just going to look at Paul. I'm going to look at Peter. I'm going to look at John. I'm going to look at Jesus, what he said. So what did the other Bible authors say about exactly the same topic that I'm studying in one passage compared to others? Number five. It's not just enough to say, what did the person mean when he wrote this? But how did the original hearers understand this also? How did the crowd respond when Jesus said something? What was happening in the temple when Peter and John said something, and how did they understand it? Let me give you a good example of this. There are, there are lots of people who say Jesus never said that he was equal to God the Father. And yet, isn't it interesting when he said, I and the Father are one, or when he was saying that before, before Abraham or Moses ever existed, I am. 
And the crowd immediately picked up stones. They wanted to kill him because they understood that Jesus was making himself equal with God. How the people in that story heard and understood what was happening is a very important thing for us to be able to understand how we can understand this passage as well. So number five is how did the original hearers understand this thing? Number six, how does the original message then apply to my life? I am not trying to come up with a new idea, a new understanding of this passage. I want to go back to the original message and say, all right, if Jesus was teaching on this issue, if Paul or Peter or John was teaching on this issue, how is it supposed to affect my life today? And then as a pastor, I have to push beyond me. And I say, how does this message then apply to the people of my church? All right. Let me give you, this is so important for you to hear and understand. There is a huge difference between biblical commands and biblical principles. There are certain things that we are commanded not to do or to avoid adultery or to avoid drunkenness or to avoid certain things. And they are very, those commands are very specific. But there are also principles that have different applications. When it says, don't love the world, what does that mean? Don't love the world or the things that are in the world. A hundred years ago, there would have been a different understanding or application of what it means to not love the world. Even today in our culture, in our world, not loving the world may have different applications between India, Pakistan, and the United States. It's the same principle that I'm supposed to love God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength and not be sucked in to the message, the media, and all of the values of our culture. But how those things are expressed and what I'm supposed to avoid may be different at times, either in the time zone or the time period or even the countries that we're living in. And for those of us who are Bible teachers, our responsibility is to look at these things that we read as principles or commands and understand how they impact my life and how I'm supposed to accurately communicate them, understand and communicate them when I'm preaching. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Because This is the great burden and the hard work of studying the Bible and understanding it so that I can teach it to others accurately. All right? Let's go back to the rules. We determine the type of literature. We understand the context. We look at the seven core questions. And then here's the fourth rule. And that is as much as possible. Study the original languages. As much as possible, study the original languages. And and I understand that this is more difficult for some than others. Some of us have been trained in, and remember, the original language of the Old Testament is Hebrew, and the original language of the New Testament is Greek. And some of us have had greater opportunities to study original language than others. And there are tools that help us understand the original languages. And it's through those tools, and it might be a computer program, it might be having different Bibles, and that's why I say, look, look at other translations. Never just, if you can, If you can, if you have the resources, always have at least two or three good translations. And why do I say that? The Bible was communicated to us by God breathing into the writers. And the original writings of Scripture were flawless. It was absolutely perfect. Brothers, 
I hope you can understand me when I say there is no such thing as a perfect translation. There's no such thing as a perfect translation. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Steve? Why would you say that? That there is no perfect translation. And that's very easy to explain to you because there are certain words or idioms or phrases that happened in the Hebrew or the Greek that when you're translating into another language, there is no perfect translation for it. There's no idiom that, do you understand the term idiom? If I were to say to you, an idiom is when you use one word that means a completely different thing. If I said, man, did I have a ball last night? Would any of you understand what I was talking about? I had, man, we had a ball. Well, here in America, I don't know about India or Pakistan or Tanzania, but here in America, if I said that I went to a party and I had fun, we would use that phrase, I had a ball. And it represents, I had a fun time. But if I were playing baseball or basketball in sports and I said, I have a ball, that's completely different as an idiom from we had a ball last night. And in every language, every country, in every time period, you have idioms that we use to express ourselves that often don't translate into other languages. They don't, they simply don't have a phrase for that. And both the Hebrew and the Greek have idioms at times. And in order for us to understand, we need to be able to look and say, how does, how does one translation you know, translate this issue? Here's another reason why you use multiple translations and there's no one perfect translation. That's because languages, every language changes. Every language is a living language. There is not one language in the world that is spoken exactly the same way today that it was 100 years ago or 200 or 500 years ago. If I pick up an original 1611 King James Bible, most people today can't even read it. And you're going to have to trust me on that. Most people cannot pick up a 1611 King James translation and read it because our language, the English language, has changed so much. And that's why new translations are always coming out is because languages change. And in order to be able to fully appreciate and understand what's being said for my preaching and teaching, I always, always compare every passage of Scripture I'm studying to at least five different translations. Because I want to see how various translators and editors take this passage from Greek or Hebrew to the English language. And if you're only using one translation, if you only have one translation, that's fine. I don't want to make anyone feel guilty if they're not using multiple languages but it, or multiple translations. But if you have the opportunity to look at modern translations with older translations, with different modern translations, it is a great value to compare translations to see, because I want to accurately communicate the word in my culture. And so I'm looking. Let me give you an example about verb tenses. In the English translations, all right, so in the Greek, in the Greek New Testament, there are lots of different translations. If we use what's called a present tense verb, that implies continuous motion. It's supposed to be doing something every day. If, if I'm using an imperative verb, there's always an exclamation point because it's a command. When I'm teaching the Bible, I'm looking at the original language because I want to make sure I understand the tense of the verb because the tense of the verb communicates something very important about how we're supposed to perceive this or understand it. When... Jesus, if I'm using the older translations like the King James Version or a New American Standard Bible, when after Jesus' resurrection, Mary is holding, he, he, Mary comes to Jesus and he says, Touch me not. 
It almost sounds like he's saying before she even begins, touch, don't touch me. But if you look at the language of the Greek and the verb tense, she's already holding on to him. And he's saying, stop clinging to me. It's very different in translation. And some people create a whole theology out of some, a passage like that because they don't understand the original language and the tenses that are being used. All right, and here's the last. Use commentaries and study Bibles and other tools so that you can study the original languages to have a fuller understanding, all right? Now, let me pull all this together and say, if you and I are going to be accurate Bible interpreters and, and teachers, there are some pitfalls to avoid. Don't ever, ever, ever take scripture out of context. Study it in the context. Number two, don't ever, ever, ever twist scripture to fit your own goals, your own theology. That's what happens every time you hear one of those prosperity teachers. They're twisting scripture to fit their own theology. Don't ever skip over passages that are hard and challenging. Do the hard work of Bible study. Don't ignore difficult passages just because you're having trouble understanding. If you're hitting a passage and you're having a hard time understanding it, send me a note. Ask Pastor Steve, what is this passage about? I will be more than glad to help you. Yesterday, I was having a difficult time understanding something, and I contacted one of my best friends in the ministry and said, what, is, what am I missing here? And he was able to help me, and I want to be here to be able to help you. Don't ever, ever start looking for hidden things in the Scripture, hidden codes, hidden meanings. This is what the cults do. Don't ever do that. And don't ever, ever, ever interpret the Bible in a way that contradicts God's character. It misrepresents God's promises and expectations. It creates unorthodox or untrue theology, or it contradicts the great historic teachings of the Bible. Study what other Bible teachers have said, all right? Now, this is the big picture of biblical hermeneutics. This is what we study because we want to make sure that we are accurately communicating God's word. And can I close with this statement to all of you? I love you so much. I'm so honored that God gives me the opportunity to speak to you and to teach you. This last week, a young man in the pastorate called me and he said, Pastor Steve, I am praying that God gives me a large church, and I want you to know what I told him. I said, don't ever pray for a large church. Don't just pray for a large church. Pray that your church is a healthy church. Pray that your church is a healthy church. And your church is going to be healthy if you and I faithfully study the Bible, if we faithfully teach the Bible, and if we faithfully live the Bible in front of our family and our church, and when the church is healthy, God will bring people to it. The church will grow, as, and it's ultimately up to God how big he wants our church to get. Honestly, when I had a church of 35, if all God ever wanted was 35 people in my church, I would have been content. As long as those 35 people were healthy followers of Jesus. That's all we care about, is having a healthy church. And if God wants to bring growth into our churches, then he can do that. All right? So I challenge you to be a healthy pastor who teaches the Word of God correctly. And God will use you to build the lives of other people who are followers of Jesus. All right? So let me pause there. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know, whoops, here. Stop share. There we are. All right. Let me let me just pause here now and say, boy, I hope that I've been able to challenge you to be a more careful and understanding Bible teacher. Now, somebody left me the question here. Uh, Pastor Samuel said, uh, 
what do I think about the amplified version? I think it's a wonderful version. I think it's one of the clearest translations and most complete translations that we have. Now, here in America, we have lots of good translations. My personal favorite, the one that I read and study from every day, is called the New Living Translation. We have the King James translation is very good, but a lot of the language is outdated now. Uh, there are many, many good translations, but my my favorite is the New Living Translation, and that's my go-to. Our church uses the new uh, the New International Version, the 2011 New International Version, and that's very helpful for us. But my goal here today is to challenge you to carefully study and interpret the scriptures properly so that you can communicate the Bible to your people with clarity and truth. All right. I hope that I've I hope that this presentation has has given you the framework and the tools to be able to do that. All right. Now, let me just pause and say, are there any other questions? And I I know it's 1230 here, and I know it's getting late in some of your countries, but before we close, do you have any other questions that I can answer based on our study today? I do. Yep. Go ahead, Patricia. Um, this 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 uh, lesson is for me, especially not being a pastor, is very very tough. And I know you've gone over this a lot. And when you're talking to people, and uh, which is good, why you keep telling us to go back to the seven core questions yep. um, with apologetics, I. Not too long ago, I was speaking to someone, he's a Catholic, um, and when we were talking about the Bible, he says he doesn't take the Bible literally. Is it, um, is that has something to do with hermeneutics where people may- Absolutely. If he doesn't take it literally, he's saying, if I, if I value the Bible law at all, it's only as a moral book of ethics. And he misses the whole point of redemption. Anybody who says, I don't take the Bible literally, is saying, well, I don't know if I agree with the miraculous elements. I don't know if I believe that Jesus was God's son. I don't believe in eternal life. But I value the Bible because it speaks to me and makes me want to be a better person. And that's that's tragic. Absolutely tragic. Because they miss the reason that God gave us the Bible in the first place. So there's a redemptive uh, issue here. So when they don't take it literally, and they're they're in church, they're they're always in church, they're always praying, and they're up, they're getting more and more upset uh, because you know the issues that are going on, and, and it's like they're getting tired, and because their prayer is not answered. How do you like uh, communicate? Uh, uh, to not offend a person because, you know, they're in the church all the time. They're reading the Bible all the time, but they don't take the Bible literally. So what do you, what, what do you do? Do you just pray for them? And, or do you, how do you speak to someone? Yeah. Like well, I mean, I, this is going to sound crazy, but if I said, look, when you and I talk to each other, what if I said to you, well, I'll listen to what you say, but I'm not going to take it literally. Mm -hmm. Would you? Would the person feel like I was valuing them, that I, I really cared about what they said? If you said, you know, I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say, but don't, don't think I'm going to take what you say literally. Then they'd say, well, why not? And you say, well, if you're not willing to do that with me or you don't want me to just take what you have to say figuratively, then why would God, why would God respond any differently. If you said, God, I'll listen to you. And if I like what you have to say, then I'll apply it to my life. But I'm not going to take everything that you say literally. They need to understand there are rules for communication, normal rules. We all have these. We live by them every day. 
And if this is how we think a relationship should function in normal life, why is our relationship with God any different? That's a good um, um, comeback, Pastor. So when people, you know, a lot of people are turning away from the church. Of course, you teach us that all the time and you see it uh, yourself. So many, you know, turn away because they, as you're teaching here, uh, say because uh, man uh, changed the Bible, you can't believe what the Bible say. So, yeah. but now when you say different languages uh, change, people, uh, what ball means to me, what something mean to me may mean something different to someone else. So we don't really understand, and they interpret, they translate the Bible through their understanding of what that word means possibly and now we're all confused how do you get i mean people you can't like people not years and years of believing that god uh, people change the bible how do you get them to believe that this is based on different languages and and, and not just right. outright changing all right. So those of us, Pat, let me let me just say those of us who have had to spend our lives studying the scripture and the history of how the Bible was written, which is a whole nother issue. It, the study of how we got the Bible is called textual criticism. That's a formal word, a formal term. It doesn't mean we're critical of the Bible, but to be critical means to be careful in your examination or study. So textual criticism means the careful study of how we got our Bible. We understand how the Bible came to us. And there aren't all sorts of these changes. There's difference in translations, and there are different reasons for that, as I've explained, as languages change. But you're never, ever, ever going to argue anybody into faith. You're never going to argue somebody into believing this. You simply have to say, look, if you really want to know God, if your heart, if God says, if you, if you want to know me, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. If your heart is really for God, say, God, if this is true, then just speak to me and teach me through your word. And faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. The more that I can get a person just willing to read the Bible and say, God, teach me what this says, the Holy Spirit will help them. We can't, yeah. don't try to argue them into No, the I don't. I used to, but I've learned a lot since then. But just to, yeah. to have this information and, and go up, it helps to take a different approach. And right. my understanding comes a way to help them. So thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Does anyone else have a question about anything that we've looked at here today? I know I've given you a lot of information, but that's why we have these classes. I want to teach you and encourage you and help you. All right. Uh, Any other questions? You. Yes. Uh, I say thank you for the good teaching. So, but for now, we wait on you to send us the PDF. PDF. I will send that out today. Yeah, for the group. Yes. Like you see the pastors from Tanzania waiting for you. Yep. Yeah, Brother Yoba is there, Brother Steven is there, the Sister Gloria is there. So many pastors are able to join you. I'm so honored, so glad. Thank and you, thank you, thank and you. And I will post this video and the PDF so that you guys can all go through this and study through it again if you want to listen to it and understand it better. Okay, thank you. If God you can help us, you can make the one, one, one room to make the teaching together in the future. All right, we can talk more about that. Okay, All right, you. it's thank getting you. very late for some. <laughs> Jossie is very tired. I can see you yawning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, all right, uh, let's close. Okay. Let's close our time together. And if anybody has a question about this, please write to me.
and I will answer your questions, and I will post this on both our Tanzania line and our our other past, Pastor Steve's Bible study line, so that you can see and hear and watch it again, all right? So yeah. let me pray for all of you. I want to pray for your Easter services this weekend. I want to pray that God will use you to share the good news of Christ not only his suffering and death, but his resurrection and the life that we have in him, all right? Let's close our time together. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here to study these challenging truths and the great responsibility that you've given us as Bible teachers and pastors. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is light. Your word gives us understanding. And so, Lord, today, I pray that you would strengthen your church. I pray that our churches would be healthy because they are led and taught by healthy pastors who understand how to interpret the Bible and teach it. Lord, we pray for our churches that are represented here on our Bible study platforms that this Easter we would be able to boldly proclaim that Jesus is alive, that we would celebrate together the new life that we have because of Jesus' death and resurrection. We look forward to that great day when we will stand before you with all of the believers who have gone before us, and for those who are yet to come, and we will just praise your name as the risen Lord, our great Redeemer King. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you all. I was, I am so happy to be here with you every Thursday. Yeah, I love thank you. you. Thank you. Happy thank Easter you, to you. everyone. Yes, happy yes, you receive. All right. God's blessings. Goodbye. Amen. Bye. 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 Bye.